So we're joined today by Will Palachik, Willie P. Uh, you know him from Twitter at Willie P Style. He's the Charlotte FC radio play-by-play. You can also get him on Apple Plus uh, during the game broadcast. You change the audio setting to local radio, and that is the best way to listen uh, along while you're watching Charlotte FC. Uh, he is the play-by-play along with friend of the pod, Jess Sharman. And he's the host of WFNZ's Panther and Hornets post-game shows and so much more. Willie P., how are you doing today, bud? I'm good, Luke and Cole. Appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Um, so what we're doing here is the, the media series where we're uh, talking and getting to know some members of the Charlotte FC media community, whether that's the official um you know, professional media like yourself or, and also some of the fan media figures like your top in nineties out there. Uh, so can you kind of tell us where do you fit into the Charlotte FC ecosystem? How do you see yourself as part of the bigger picture? I'd like to consider myself uh, somebody who is the biggest fan of the club, uh, who just happens to be a, uh, a person who works in a capacity that uh, is unlike any other and, and having the, uh, the honor and privilege of being able to to tell the story of this great club and uh, having been able to do so from really the very beginning. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people who consume our product who, who very much like it. And I know that from the standpoint of, of where we sit, you know, we try to do our best to get the pulse of the fan. And I think the one thing that if you look at both Jess and me, you know, we both grew into this sport uh, as people who, you know, consumed it at a very high level, uh, Jess had an amazing amount of experience before joining Charlotte FC, broadcasting at the UPSL and USL levels. Uh, I was an accomplished broadcaster in other sports, but always had a love of soccer. And you know, the way that I kind of got involved with Charlotte FC is, you know, our radio station wanted to have them on the air, and our boss, before we, you know, even had a contract or anything set, was like, hey, you know get yourself over and uh, introduce yourself to those guys because uh, we want to be a big part of what they're doing and uh, forge the relationship, and now here we are. That's fantastic. And as you said, you're, you're an accomplished broadcaster in several markets, and I believe that includes the Atlanta market as well. True, very much so. so. Were, were you there when they launched uh, Atlanta United and the, the process that they went through for that? I, I was not there at the launch. I got to Atlanta um, in 2019, so uh, it would have been about uh, – it basically, it was the off season after they won their championship. So, oh, wow. yeah. Uh, so I was basically coming in while the Atlanta United thing was a fever pitch. And, you know, I started working at a radio station down there, which was the home of the Hawks, the Falcons, and Atlanta United. And I was working as a part-time host, uh, doing stuff mostly on the weekends. And the person who hired me said, you know, all of our hosts know how to talk about the Falcons and the Hawks. But many of our part-time hosts don't have really a soccer proficiency. So he said to me, you could get ahead very, very easily by showing that you're adept at talking about Atlanta United. And of course, as I told you guys, I... I've always been a soccer fan. Uh, I played it growing up. I didn't play it to the level that Jess did, but uh, I played enough. And uh, and obviously, when it came to to knowing about the sport, I uh, always consumed it. I went to D.C. United games when I was a kid growing up in D.C. Uh, didn't get to any sporting Kansas City games when I was out in Missouri, but I did definitely consume those games, consume the World Cup. Uh, there's a funny scenario where in the 2006 World Cup, I had summer classes at Mizzou and there may or may not have been a stray eye on my phone, you know, trying to figure out what was going on with the United States, Ukraine, or Italy during that time. I moved to Houston in 2014. Uh, that was another World Cup year, so I ended up getting involved with the uh, American Outlaws chapter down there and watching a lot of the World Cups uh, down there and also uh, getting Dynamo season tickets uh, first year that I was there. I wasn't able to go to as many games when uh, in subsequent years after that because I ended up getting a show that broadcast on Saturday nights and it just didn't really work out from a timing aspect. I wasn't using as many of the tickets in the second year as I, as I had the previous year. So I had to let those go, but still consumed a lot of Houston dynamo soccer. Uh, Glenn Davis is somebody who I consider a great friend. Uh, we had a chance to talk a lot 
Um, they call him Mr. Soccer down there. So I, I popped in on his show every once in a while, whenever I could. Uh, and then I moved to Atlanta in, again, 2019. So it was right after the 2018 championship. And from the moment I got there, I became a sponge, uh, learned about the club, learned about uh, the broadcasters of the club. Mike Conti and Jason Longshore are people who I consider mentors and personal friends. I think, Jess, if uh, you've talked to her, she'll tell you the same about both those gentlemen. I find them to be the gold standard when it comes to radio in our uh, in our little ecosystem and industry because they do a fantastic job of keeping a conversational professional, but also, again, sounding like fans. And so I felt like – if I ever wanted to break into being a broadcaster, their model was a great one to follow. And then uh, the boss that we had in Atlanta ended up moving up to Charlotte, taking the program director job here. And that's how he kind of uh, poached me from the Atlanta station and how I ended up in Charlotte uh, about three years ago. All yeah, right. I, uh, I actually remember when you were at Sports Talk in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, I helped start up with uh, the Spurs Up show that covers the University of South Carolina. And I remember you being with that. That's how I first heard your name. So it was very interesting for me when you got the job and uh, to realize, oh, man, that's that's, that's wild. Um, the, the, corn, the corn blue time was a very interesting time for me. Very yeah, interesting. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess one of my biggest questions I have for you is, like, we've had Jess on the show before. Um, we love Jess. Jess is awesome. Uh, how, how did that kind of come about getting that chemistry? Because I'm actually, I actually call for ESPN plus for Furman university and, uh, their, their soccer games. And you know, it, it's very interesting to me to see how people get their styles and, you know, and how they bounce off of, off of each other during a game. Uh, how, how did y'all build that chemistry? Was there a, um, uh, before, you know, obviously before the first match, did y'all sit down and watch previous matches and kind of talk about, or, and, bounce off one another, see how each other operated. How was that uh, process lot for you guys? I'll say this. Uh, I knew of Jess uh, from my time in Atlanta. We actually had a very, uh, a very funny first interaction. I don't know if she's told this story or not, but um, I was doing a show in Atlanta and we did a show that centered around uh, women uh, in sports, kind of the women and girls in sports day. Uh, and I interviewed somebody who was in the Atlanta soccer community by the name of Kelly Francis and Kelly was great. Uh, it was something that was actually set up by my producer at the time, uh, Jahi Whitehead. Uh, but the one thing that I got uh, from people in the Atlanta soccer community was that, well, if you really want to feature somebody, and this is no slight to Kelly, but if you wanted to feature somebody who was in the Atlanta soccer community, you have to feature Jess Charman. So her name got on my radar then. And I, from that point in time, kind of started looking at her stuff and I became a, a Jess Charman fan. Uh, Anytime she had a broadcast, I'd, I'd tune it in just to try and see, you know, you know what she's doing, what she's talking about, and 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 how she basically seemed to be uh, circumnavigating the state of Georgia and uh, and all points around to to make that happen. Um, when the time came for us to kind of start thinking about the deal uh, with Charlotte FC, uh, my boss came to me again pretty early on and said, "We want to have you involved." Uh, I didn't know necessarily what that involvement looked like. I thought, you know, hey, I could be like a host and, you know, host a podcast or be a, you know, sideline reporter or stuff like that. Because, again, I'd done play-by-play, -play, uh, but I hadn't done pro soccer on a professional level. And so that, I don't want to say felt like a Mount Olympus for me, but it just never was a thought that entered into my mind. And then my boss came to me and said, we're looking at you to be the play-by-play -play announcer. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so that was like okay so then he's like do you have anybody in mind who you'd want to have be an analyst and so we threw about a bunch of names and and you know he started doing some interviews and things of that nature and then eventually you know jess's name kind of came up and i said well i definitely know her uh but i also feel like you know i'm wondering whether or not she'd be interested uh i didn't have her number at the time but my boss said, can you get us in touch with her? And so I reached out to the intermediary who was, uh, you know, Jason, who was the uh, color commentator on Atlanta United, who is a mutual friend of ours. And I said, hey, you know, uh, do you think Jess would be interested? And he picked her brain and he called me back within 30 seconds and said, yeah, she would. And so I got her on a call with my boss. And I think from the moment he heard the two of us, he said, this is my booth. Because yeah. from the moment we started talking to each other, it seemed like we had just kind of that spark. Uh, we did a bunch of games on monitors to kind of get the, the chemistry flow going. We watched 
Um, we watched the 2021 MLS Cup between NYC and uh, Portland. We did a couple of Atlanta games just because that was kind of the, the team that we were most familiar with at the time between the two of us. I think we did one more game that didn't involve Atlanta um, as well, just to kind of get some variety. And we did these over a couple of different times. And honestly, calling a game on a monitor is not, not easy, especially when you know what's going to happen. So you almost kind of had to like feign your, uh, I, I, there was part of me that wanted to like go back and look and see what happened. So I know when the goals would come, but then there's another part of me that was like, you want to try and sound the most organic as possible. Obviously we also weren't doing them with the benefit of crowd noise. So uh, some of those recordings seem rather static, but uh, I found out right away that it seemed like of, of anybody who I'd been with, it was going to work, even though it might've taken a little bit to really kind of get our bearings together, especially because again, this is a new partner. This is a new team. Nobody really knows what soccer in Charlotte or soccer on radio in Charlotte is supposed to really sound like. Uh, we wanted to be the defining nature of what of what soccer on the radio sounded like. And I think, you know, first couple of weeks were a little nervy for me personally. I can't speak for Jess, but I, I think, you know, once we kind of got uh, that first win under our belt, I think at that point in time, it's like, OK, this is this is good. This is going to work. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that makes a lot of sense. And we all saw during COVID when uh, the big broadcasters had to shift to studio coverage of games. Uh, the quality is it's so hard to replicate being there in person. Um, and you guys have always done such a good job. Like I said, at the top, if I'm watching on, on Apple TV and uh, we're not at a bar at a watch party, then I'm changing the audio so I can hear you guys talk about it because I know you're there in person. You're knowledgeable. You're very familiar with our team. And then you do your research on the other team. Can you kind of tell me as far as, when it's a game week, how do you prepare for the upcoming Charlotte FC game, both with the team and preparing for the opposition? Well, I kind of divide it by the day. Um, honestly, I start the week off on a Sunday or a Monday between one of those two days is a day off because coming off a game, I always kind of need like a day to decompress and, you know, get away from football. Don't really, you know, consume it or anything like that. But on the day, that's not the day off. I'm going back and watching the previous game that we played. And trying to, you know, see first off what the guys on TV are saying about us and also try and pick out things that I might not have seen because, you know, when you're when you're doing play by play, all you're watching is the ball. And so you're trying to maybe pick up some different things on second watch that I might not have seen a potential run that a guy made that didn't connect or certain motions with the defense. So the thing that I'll say about our club is that. Uh, the defensive organization uh, after rewatching the NYC game is, is, is just extraordinary. I mean, the way that Dean had the players move without the ball uh, and how the defense was so revolving around the ball is something that while I'm following the opposition, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. And even Jess made a couple of points of it saying it on the broadcast, but you don't appreciate it until you're watching it outside of a play by players mind. Um, Tuesday's kind of when I update a lot of my stuff, uh, I'll take a first look at the opposition and, and kind of uh, watch some games from them. Uh, I'll look at my board and see what I need to edit on our side from a Charlotte perspective, update the stats, update anecdotes, things of that nature. Uh, Wednesday, I'll really kind of get into the opposition's board construction. Uh, I'll, we'll get our first look at training as well. They train on Wednesday and Thursday, open to the media. So I have an opportunity to, to be there and watch that on Wednesday. Uh, and talk to players Thursday Dino does his presser and when I'm not at Dino's presser um, I'm helping kind of find out and fine-tune my board on the opposition side and then Friday it's just kind of you know fine-tuning I try not to take it all the way up to game time just because I feel like if you're cramming it's like cramming for a test you don't do well and that information is not retained so I try to have my boards done by Friday night so that Saturday I can you know cut them out put them together and uh, have them ready to go for uh 7 30 kickoff on Saturday night did you expect as a student at Mizzou that uh, a large part of your job would be arts and crafts? No, I did not. <laughs> I, I did not. I, uh, it's funny. My wife actually helps a lot. Um, and not because I make her because she literally has, has said, I want to help you do this because she, she's been an incredible, incredible uh, source of support. Uh, not only with that, but just emotionally. Um, there are times doing this where, you don't know whether it's working. You don't know whether it's right. Um, I think the viral moment uh, that took place last year with Cincinnati um, offered a very 
interesting look into uh, to the self and subconscious of, of what can happen as a broadcaster, because at times you, you have you are of two minds. You like getting noticed, but you also feel like there are things that are said that, you know, might be construed as hurtful, not necessarily as uh, as flattering as you might have originally thought them, but you kind of take them in stride. But but yeah, she uh, she always kind of says, hey, is it when's it when's it time for arts and crafts? She literally says it just like that. <laughs> and, you know, she'll cut out the squares and then I'll post them on a post it note and then I'll stick them on my board. And it's a uh, it's a real fun moment where we get the bond and you know, she'll ask me questions. She's like, Oh, well, this is a new player. I don't know who this is or, or why are they not starting this player? And I'll tell her. And then when we see a lot of the funny part is when we go through opposing teams and she'll be like, Oh my God, I hate this guy. Oh, I can't stand him. Like she said that about um, uh, John Tolkien of uh, yeah. New York Red Bulls. She's yeah. like, Oh, I hate totally. that. That's the blonde guy. Right. I'm like, yeah. Agreed. Like, oh, I agree I can't with her. And that I'm, guy. So it's, it's just like, as the fact American. that she's she's built bought in as much as uh as anybody is is just a great great source of joy for me. That's fantastic. I, I'm torn on Tolkien because as a as an American outlaw, you know, want to see him do well for the national team, but then when we play Red Bulls, obviously, uh, we kind of don't like them very much, do we? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> and, and speaking on that viral moment from last year, uh, we we don't have to you know harp on it, but I. I thought that it was very cool to see the Charlotte FC community come together and essentially have your back to the point where, you know, I, I just seen, I just remember seeing tweet after tweet after tweet, just defending you and how everyone was saying, we don't want anybody else. This is our guy. We, you know, and to me that has to make you feel good that at least, you know, your fan base is coming together to defend you. They're not, you know, participating in it. It, it was incredibly gratifying. Um, the thing I remember about that, was remembering that for whatever reason uh the club and their initial promotion of the goal used our call i don't know if it was they were rolling on the uh the local radio feed with the apple pictures or what or, or how it how it got distributed i have no idea but i thank the lord that it happened that way because uh it wouldn't have gotten the attention it did i don't think i think the immediacy of it with the fact that that was the first video out there of that goal uh it was such also i mean just on its own was a remarkable goal and, and he scored two remarkable goals with very, very little uh, touch on the ball, which I think was the extraordinary part of it. And that's why I just, I rose to that, that level. I honestly had thought that in other goals I'd reached to a, you know, level that was even beyond that, but uh, that's the one that the world heard. And I, I think at the beginning of it, like even Jess, we were started noticing it during the post game. She's like, Will, there's a lot of people talking about this. Like, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't know. I just let it happen. And then like, I, I got home and my wife's like, Will, it's like everywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't really sleep a lot that night just cause it was kind of, again, a lot of the initial comments were somewhat negative or, or poking fun at my voice. And I saw the Mickey mouse thing kind of came out and then, and I woke up the next morning and I saw a lot of the statements of support. And, uh, and actually, again, it was my wife who said, you know what you should just do just post a Mickey gif. Yeah. And lean just, into it. <laughs> and just, just, just do that. And don't say anything more about it. Just say, just post a Mickey gif. And lo and behold, I posted the, I had thought to do the steamboat Willie. Cause, cause I know that that was the first depiction of Mickey when, uh, when he was back in the, uh, back in the first creations of, uh, from Walt Disney. And so I just posted that and, uh, and that got more of the attention. Um, I did an interview with Pablo Maurer of the athletic too, which was really cool. Uh, I don't think I've ever had one that, uh, an interview that really had to deal with anything other than my departure from a, a station or anything like that, that I've had to do about mine. So that was pretty cool. And, you know, more and more people reached out. I think people in, in England reached out uh, a couple of South American uh, media outlets also reached out. So. I mean, when you're talking about the iconic goal calls that we all, Look, recognize... it, uh, I think it was cool at the end of the day. Uh, what's that? Sorry. What's that? Uh, it was freezing up on my side. So, so I thought, I thought you had paused. Um, no, so I, uh, I basically, so it ended up being really cool. I, I ended up really benefiting a lot from it. Yeah. And I mean, just talk about the iconic goal calls, uh, around the world that we all see on highlights. A lot of them are those South American, um, you know, broadcasters and for you to have such an iconic, um, an iconic, uh, vocal distinction, you know, that's 
that's a good thing. And your your regular broadcast uh, play by play voice is is deeper. And like I was telling you earlier, the cadence and the presence in the mic, you, you just fill the space so well. Um, I think when you get passionate and that enthusiasm really shows through, that's that makes you iconic in that way. Um, what came to mind was uh, there's a comedian, English comedian, uh, Jimmy Carr. And yes. Very iconic laugh. And he's actually playing here in Charlotte. I, I got tickets for a show next month. Um, I'm a big fan, but he has probably the most iconic laugh uh, that you could ever hear. It's like a seagull. Um, right. So he took that distinction and made it kind of like his iconic calling card. Um, and I, I had a whole joke about, you know, the uh, Bank of America is like our kingdom. And it's always good to have a little bit of magic in the kingdom. Right. Right. So, no, we, we love it, and we love having you as our play-by-play guy. So I'm also very glad that the rest of the Charlotte FC fans all came in to defend you. Um, but, I mean, hey, going viral, that's that's insane. There's not very many broadcasters who have those moments. Sure. Um, what other moments in your career, uh, going back to uh, – was, was your first broadcast gig with the uh, Kinston Indians? It was. Oh, my. That was – well, that was – that was my first uh, full. Well, it wasn't a full time, but it was my first uh, play-by-play radio gig uh, over the summer between my junior and senior year. Um, I'd work. I went to Mizzou, like you mentioned. Uh, so I had done some, you know, TV there. Uh, the great part about being out there, quick plug on on my alma mater, is that uh, you have the opportunity there to work uh, with an NBC station, and it basically serves as a teaching lab. So. I had at least had some comfort with being on camera and doing news stories with them and, and also with our, our campus news station, which uh, is a bit of a different offshoot through the university. But uh, Kinston was the first time I had ever done kind of professional play-by-play before. So I did it as an internship through a guy who uh, was also a Mizzou alum, uh, networking help there, obviously. Uh, he now actually is the uh, – director of broadcasting voice of the Campbell fighting camels. Uh, so he, uh, he's okay. probably that into a pretty awesome career for himself as well. Uh, but we were together in Kinston for that one summer. Uh, he was there before and after me and I was kind of his number two and uh, got a real baptism by fire doing that. Um, went to the okay. Savannah sand Nats uh, the year after that Savannah sand Nats, by the way, the, uh, the minor league team that pre or that was a precursor to the now Savannah bananas. Uh, we didn't have uh, we didn't have banana ball there. Uh, we didn't have a, a ringmaster out in front of the uh, in front of home plate there uh, making things happen. I, I was the ringmaster, so to speak. There you go. <laughs> well, so I mean, calling baseball obviously you have a lot more time to fill. Uh, there's a lot more spaces between the action. Mm-hmm. How was that as uh, a broadcaster to come up with that as your practice, as your experience to? Uh, like I said earlier, fill the space. It, it, there's never uh, dead air when you're when you're calling a game well the uh i think honestly the the best part about being baseball is is knowing you don't have to necessarily fill every single space that is there you can let the game breathe a little bit but if you do it too much then you're looked at as being lazy or whatever but like if there is a big moment and you have the crowd going crazy it's okay to lay out and let that happen like with there's three and two on the batter in the ninth inning and you're in a one-run game like you can you can lay out and let the moment breathe itself and and have you be able to feel the tension and and even that's something that you know during Charlotte FC broadcasts I do as well especially when we're at home because you can kind of feel the tension you know late in games one goal lead I think I, I probably noticed myself laying out a lot more uh during the NYC game just because it was the first time we'd had a crowd that big other than maybe the uh, decision day game last year uh, where we were holding a lead. So that that was a scenario that was a rather unique one for us to, to kind of lean on and be in. But, uh, but baseball is a different animal, man. Um, there's a lot. The one thing that I will say with baseball is that there are plenty of situational stats that can fill, uh, fill the time. Uh, the way that I organize my baseball booth, uh, one of the, one of the duties uh, I had, again, I was an intern in addition to being an on-air broadcaster is that at the beginning of the day, I would print out this 27 page and it was 27 pages, 27 page stat pack of like literally everything that you could possibly think of when it comes to situational stats, you had season stats, you had stats versus the opponent. You had uh, what they were in the seventh inning or later, you know, what they were on Monday, Tuesday, like everything, like all kinds of different, just minute details 
that you could put in. And so what I would do, and and I got this from my partner, Chris Haymeyer at the time, he would tape them up all, all around his, uh, his broadcast booth to the point where it almost looked like you were shaded like a camouflage uh, and you had like a little area to like peek in with the eyes and then everything else was covered by paper. It wasn't that bad, but I'm, I'm being hyperbolic, but that was kind of the reference point. And I would circle some, I would underline some, I'd, 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 I'd highlight the guys who were in the lineup that day and, and the pitcher that was in the lineup that day. And, and I think you just kind of you lean on certain things you want to you want to highlight and you also have game notes, obviously, that make things work there as well that that help you. And, and it also just helps being around the players like that's the part that when you are uh, when you're in a a broadcast for a team is what makes it so unique and different uh, than what you might see and hear on TV with these guys who, and again, no offense to them, but they, they kind of parachute in the day in uh, the day beforehand and uh, yeah. kind of have to, to crash prep, so to speak. Yeah. We saw that in the preseason against uh, what was it? LA galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, Enzo cup of tea. Mm -hmm. That was uh, a, and, and that guy is, I mean, he's at like galaxy's radio announcer. So I don't, I don't want to give him too much stick. He, you know, he has his agenda and what he wants to do with it. And so it, it I felt like that was uh that was an unfortunate moment for him. I I loved it, man. Honestly, unironically, I loved it. Um, I thought it was just a lot of fuel, especially in preseason. Like that's a time where you can you can have some fun with it. Sure. And, uh, you know, they're playing their young guys, we're playing our young guys. Um <clears throat> let me ask you, I, I had the pleasure of hosting a Friday morning radio show in college, but I see that you had the big show in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. which one do you prefer really? Is, is it the post games for like the Hornets and the Panthers, or do you like having that afternoon drive time type show where you have the callers and you have like the same kind of uh, characters and you can really have a conversation with the fans? I, I mean, I'll say this: the the adrenaline from hosting a regular radio show is unlike anything you'll do on the sports talk business. I'm, I'm taking play by play out of the the equation here. Uh, because you are able to build that rapport with listenership. Um, I love doing the Hornets post games. Uh, I love doing the uh, the call ins after Panther games. Uh, I think those those things are incredibly intimate. Uh, but again, they are sports specific, and we talk a lot about trying to fill time. Uh, your your menu and your palate is a lot more full when you're doing a sports talk show every day because you're at the mercy of whatever the news of the day is or whatever you can come up with kind of, you know, uh, in the prep process. Whereas with a Hornet game or a Panther game, you are at the mercy of, of the news cycle. You're at the mercy of what's going on. So uh, sometimes you kind of, at those, in those scenarios have to make uh, chicken salad of the chicken, you know what, uh, because of the fact that, you know, you might have a game where, you know, you lose by 30 or you might have a game where your team wins by 30 and you, there's really nothing more to break down. It's like, okay, yeah, uh, team wins by 30. Not really must, uh, not, not really a way to slice it here. Uh, even the other night, uh, Hornets played, uh, Portland and Portland shot, uh, like 9% or something, or not even like maybe like 4%, whatever it was like three for 30. Uh, that that's the scenario where you look at it and you say, okay, you know, Portland just couldn't hit, you know, couldn't hit water if they fell out of a boat. Like that's, that's how you go about it. And, and there really isn't a lot of substance to it. So I think the ability to provide probably more substance and, and, and cut deeper is uh, something you only get from, you know, hosting a sports talk show day in, day out. But being uh, the captain of your own ship, being able to kind of set the topic, set so. the conversation. Very much so. I get that. I get that. Do you think that's something that could be in your future again, or do you, are you going to stick with the, uh, the kind of game day presence. I uh, I'm at the mercy of whatever uh, the folks at WFNZ feel my role uh, should be. I you know I tried out for a couple of different roles that they uh, had over the course of the last couple of months. Uh, those roles went to other people. I'm very happy for those dudes. Uh, and I love the role that I have. I mean I I got a pretty cushy job uh, being the voice of Charlotte FC or one of the voices of Charlotte FC. I I, uh, I kind of feel like there's a lot of my plate just trying to figure out how to do that. And uh, I'm happy for any other work that comes alongside. That's fantastic. Uh, so you guys obviously take uh, a portion at the end of the game, the, the recap, and you package that in, in the podcast format. Uh, can you tell us what we have in store this season with the podcast? Any, any differences or uh, updates to the format? So we're actually uh, kind of relaunching the podcast. Uh, we're doing a uh, 
kind of a new look at it. Uh, we're not in a kind of being the, the there's plenty of you know the podcasts that do the you know heavy breakdown you know every game et cetera and so on and and I, I think we want to make our uh, our on air product kind of stand out more and stand alone so that's why we started po- uh, posting the post game shows and kind of having that as our uh, as our avenue for folks to get the game by game breakdown and then what we're doing with Crown Corner is. You know, we are going to center it around interviews and, and make it more bigger picture. It's going to come out once every two weeks as opposed to every week. We're going to start uh, with uh, Monday of the following uh, uh, the Vancouver contest. So uh, we will have an opportunity to get, you know, interviews with some players and, and coaches and front office members. And and also we're able to still discuss, you know, the big trends that are going on. It's just we will we'll have more of a. We'll have more of a sample size to talk about because we'll be talking about, you know, two games instead of one and uh, and a look ahead to two games instead of one because I think a lot of times you get down to the minute, you know, game by game by game breakdown. A lot of times it kind of feel like you're doing the same show over and over again and it's not really cutting through. So I think this is an opportunity for us to kind of take a step back and, and like I said, let our on-air product uh, that we have on the radio side really showcase itself, number one, and number two, uh, able to – be able to use our access to uh, to players and coaches and and tell further tell the story about what's going on with our beloved football club. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Cole, any questions? As we yeah, start? I just had one. I just had one more really. Um, so obviously going to Mizzou and being at Sports Talk, you, you're very familiar with the SEC football and the atmospheres that go along with it. Uh, I'm obviously a South Carolina football fan. I've been a Gamecock club member my whole life, so. Roll Tide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's settle down. Uh, I, I know that uh, I try to tell my non-soccer friends with, that when I get them to come up to Charlotte, they're like, well, you know, what is it? What's it like? We don't really want to go to soccer. I'm like, dude, it is as close to you that you can get to an SEC atmosphere that you can possibly get to without it being an SEC atmosphere. How, do you kind of agree or it, I mean, how, what differences do you see, if any? Well, I, I, I very much agree, Cole. Um having been to the Grove at Ole Miss and been to Knoxville, Tennessee, and been to Tuscaloosa, Columbia. Um, I will throw Mizzou in there only because we are members, even though people might have their own thoughts about whether or not we actually are real members of the SEC. Hey, you beat South Carolina every year, so. Hey, maybe that's uh, – uh, and, and having been to College Station before they were an SEC member and, and since they've been an SEC member, I've also had the opportunity to see that. It's, it's the closest thing to it. Um, and the one thing that – I think is maybe a little bit different is that there is a sense of ownership when it comes to being a supporter of this club. And I was talking about this this morning with somebody uh, who I guess is not as in tune with this, but the way that the supporters culture work works in America and even overseas as well. But I think uniquely in this, in this country is that there is that almost kind of from the start kinship, you have supporters councils that, take the input of the supporters into mind and you do have an ability of these supporters to literally be the soundtrack and be the the heartbeat of what the club can be and and I think that's the part of it that while you get that in a sense in SEC football and and that culture I don't know if you can have a parallel or an equal when you talk about American soccer culture with major league soccer. Uh, do we get a lot of things wrong? Yeah, you can say we do. And there's a lot of people who have different opinions about, you know, pro rel and all the other things that are going on in the game right now, replacement refs, et cetera, and so on. The one thing that I think we do have going for us in this sport in America is we have the fan culture and we've got 29 great clubs, soon to be 30 who all feel like they have a sense of ownership for their club and they take their cues from, uh, across the pond as well. I mean, I just was reading about a Bundesliga team who literally was able to get a manager not hired for their open managerial spot because the supporters groups did not approve of the of the hire. Uh, yeah. What other sport can you look at and say that that actually happens? I, I don't know if there really is anybody else who could make that thing kind of ha- happen. So That's I do feel like having the ability to do that definitely gives you uh, a sense of ownership and, and makes it unique to the American sporting culture. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I love it. I love it. Um, just in closing, we're kind of wrapping up here. Uh, Willie P, thank you so much for your time. Can you tell the folks where they can find you? 
You can find me on Twitter at Willie P style. You can find our uh, broadcasts obviously on 92.7 FM in Charlotte or anywhere across the Charlotte FC radio network. And as you mentioned, uh, languages tab, select home radio for any home contest, uh, best way to follow us. And of course, follow crown corner, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, for Thank you so much, Willie. We appreciate you. Thank you guys. Appreciate you. <laughs>